Hi, welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. We've had a very interesting week in Nigeria. On Sunday of this week, we had a bomb blast in three different churches in northern Nigeria that killed over 100 people. Now, the security situation seemed to be getting worse, and this week again, the president fired the national security advisor, uh, General Andrew Azazi and the Minister of Defense. So we are looking at what does that mean for Nigeria? How has the situation taken us to a point where we think the tipping point in the country is almost here? This is the roundtable and we have a special guest today. We have Nigerian, one of the foremost writers, the young writers we have today in Nigeria, Mr. Helen Habila. He is the author of the book, Waiting for an Angel, Measuring Time, Oil on Water, and many others. So, Mr. Habila, welcome to Sahara TV. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You are one of the leading voices uh, within the, the intellectual community. And we want to know... What do you make of the situation in Nigeria today? Well, um, I, I don't claim to be an expert, you know, on, on these things, but it's my country, so all I can give is opinion um, because I'm involved, you know, because I care. Um, I think it is, you know, one of the most baffling situations. I mean, we've had a lot of challenges um, going back to independence, um, the civil war and all that. Um, but I will say this one that we're facing now is up there with, 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 with all of them. It's one of the biggest challenges. And what's making it even more um, scary is that nobody seems to know, to have a clue, you know, about what's going on um, or, or how to stop it. It's just totally, totally saddening. And I think, like you mentioned in your introduction, it's pushing the country to a precipice, you know, um, I don't know if we can get back from this this precipice. Um, it's, 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 it's good to be optimistic. I'm an optimistic person. But what makes it um, so crazy, unpredictable, is that I don't even think that the people who are perpetuating the violence know exactly what they want. They don't seem to have any, any rhyme or, or rhythm, you know? And the same thing with the government. The government doesn't seem to have a clue about what to do with them so it's 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 scary I, I hope you know things get better soon but it's just totally disheartening you are very familiar in the of the you're familiar with the north you actually schooled in joss you went to teach in bauchi uh, for those people who are not familiar with the north uh, they are baffled by what is going on they don't understand it can you can you help us understand how the, the not degenerated into this situation? Um, I, I wouldn't want to call it a kind of um, solely a northern problem. It's a Nigerian problem. And I think the sooner we start to look at that, or to look at it in that way, you know, the better for, for us to get a solution. You know, I think Nigeria has reached a level where we need to stop this, you know, uh, northern problem, southern problem, um, all that. We need to look at it. The president, for instance, and his people, the people we elected to, to office, should look at it, you know, as a challenge to the country itself and try to find a solution to it. And it has to be a holistic solution, not just a regional solution. We have this problem the same in the north as it is in the south. We cannot trust our leaders. There's so much corruption. We don't listen to the ordinary person. We don't feel their pain, you know. Look at Nigeria. 50 years after independence, we haven't solved the problem of security. We haven't solved the problem of electricity and all that. I think if you take away all these problems, if you solve them, if we have a leader that we can trust, you begin to have a country that's sane, that begins to look at itself as Nigeria. And I think that's the only way forward, you know look at the country as Nigeria, not just as, as, as a collection of regions. So you think this is political? It is political. That's my thinking. Um, it's also economical. You cannot separate the two. Um, I think religion is also there, but it's a minor part of it. It's just a struggle for power. 
And I think if we can get that resolved, if we can find a way to have a clear way of um, successorship, you know, of transition of one power, of one, one regime to another, once we can do that, we we'll begin to solve our problems. Because once there's uncertainty, there's going to be struggle because everybody thinks that, you know, it's, it's, it's an all-commerce game, so they can do whatever they can to get power. But if you know that these are the laid down rules of successorship, I think you begin to take uncertainty out of it. And people know that they cannot get away with certain things. And that's the way things are. Then you begin to obey the law and I think move forward. Now, if, if you summarize some of the statements coming from Boko Haram group, you and their sympathizers, you kind of get the feeling that they, they felt as if there is Northern Nigeria is being occupied. Is that is that the is that what you get? You know that they reject uh, the Western education, they reject uh, the 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 presence of churches and and hotels in the north. Is is that the sense? Is it is it something that is new in the north, or is it something that has been there? That feeling. Unfortunately, you know, it's not a new thing. I'm a Northern Christian. I'm from Gombe State. You know, I'm from Kaltungo. Um, so it's not a new thing in the north. There's been this crisis of religious violence once in a while, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a time when people used to live in peace, when people used to, um, you know, um, respect each other. I remember when I was growing up as, as a Christian, living with Muslims in the same compound, how our parents, our mothers would send each other food, you know, during Christmas, we send them food, during Salah, they send us food. There was a time like that. And you, if, if we can really sit down and begin to ask ourselves, when did things begin to go wrong? Or like Chino Achebe will say, when did the rain begin to, to fall on us? Then we, we can begin to look for a solution. Um, but people have to obey the law. People have to be punished when they break the law. You cannot bomb churches or, for that matter, bomb mosques and get away with it. There should be a law of the land that all people must abide by. And that is what I keep coming back. So once the government cannot enforce that law, then people do whatever they can because they can get away with it. That's the whole thing. So why are churches the target? I mean, why are churches seem to be the primary target of, of Boko Haram? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I don't work for Boko Haram, you know. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking because it defies logic. I mean, they kill Christians, they kill Muslims. So you ask yourself, what do they want? It's, it's totally, totally um, against logic. So I really don't know. Do you think that leaders in the North, that they've been doing it enough or what they, all they could do to try to control, if the federal government cannot? I mean, traditionally, it looks as if the, there are leaders who used to be able to control things in the North. Uh, but now it seems as if they, they've they lost control and the federal government lost control. Who do we run to? How do we get, how do we solve the problem? The leaders are doing enough. I don't think they have done enough. I don't think they have ever done enough. That's the whole problem, you know, with the country. The leaders have never placed themselves in the place of the common people. They don't respect the common people. They don't see the common people as worthy of respect. Because we have a system where they can buy the votes, you know, they can get into office without help of the common people. So I don't think they are doing enough, you know. I mean, look, look at it. When you have, um, you know, um, these people going to universities and shooting down people during worship or shooting people on the streets. Um, and the government cannot do anything about it. It's, it's totally crazy. This is a state of anarchy. You know, this is a state of chaos. Um, so, no, they are not doing enough. They have not done enough. And I don't know if they can even do enough because it seems to be out of their control now. Now the, the, the thing has, has kind of moved to, 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 to the disenchanted people who are neglected and now they because they are not they are not under the control of the of the leaders anymore. They have kind of gone a hole if you like. And now we know that there's a kind of an Al Qaeda connection. So it's it's even begin it's beginning to look as if they have foreign paymasters, which makes it even more difficult to control because they don't answer, you know, to, 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 to local leaders anymore or whoever, you know, um, is there to call them to order. So it's, it's crazy.
Do, do you think yeah. we should let the, the uh, countries like the United States uh, and Britain to get involved and, and try to help Nigeria if, if we can't do it ourselves? Yeah, I think it's a welcome development, you know, to get them to help us, but with certain restrictions. They, they, I mean, they shouldn't, like, come to our country and start killing people. Um, we mustn't allow that. That's handing over our sovereignty to another country. And we've seen what's happening in Pakistan and other countries where the innocent and the guilty are killed, you know, without, without distinction. We don't want that to happen in our country. Um, I think what we should share with them is their intelligence, you know. Who are these people? How do they get their money? Um, how do they recruit people? These are basic things that we should have been able to do by now, but either we cannot do it or we don't want to do it, you know? So this is where we need help from, from foreign countries. Find a way, how do they get their guns? I mean, these are, these are physical stuff that move across borders. There should be a way of monitoring them. How do they get their guns? Where do they get the money from? Who are the people? Um, being recruited, where do they come from? Where do they live? You know, I mean, really, this isn't too hard to, to find out, is it? Now, the now, new, new sec National Security Advisor, uh, Dasuki, do you think he, he will be able to handle this? It's not for one person to solve, you know. We all have to come together, you know. We can't just put our hope on one person and say he's going to solve it. Um, so he seems to have a very, very... Um, good CV on paper. Nigerians have, we all have good, good, good um, CVs. I mean, the president has a PhD, but he doesn't seem to have a clue to what's happening as well. So I don't know. He has a good military background. We'll just have to wait and see. But he does have the connection in the north, you know. If there's anyone who can talk to the people or who can find intelligence about what's happening, it should be him. So we keep our fingers crossed. You, you were once a reporter, and, and in Waiting for an Angel, you told a story of journalists trying to make survive, do their job during the dangerous regime of Sani Abacha. Uh, are you satisfied with the job that Nigerian journalists are doing today, especially in light of this situation of insecurity? Of course, I have to commend them. They're doing a very, very good job, you know, under the circumstance. I'm not saying they're perfect. You know, they have their shortcomings. We all know what their shortcomings are. But look at what they're achieving, you know, um, with all these obstacles, with the threat of death over their head, with total, um, I'm sorry, total disregard and total disrespect from the government that really doesn't support them. That's what I mean, you know, in the way that they should. And sometimes their employers don't even pay them their salary for one year, you know, or for, for, for a very long period. You ask yourself, how do they survive? How do they even do what they're doing? And we look at their history, you know, they've been in the forefront during the pro-democracy movement. People have lost their lives. People like Delegiwa. So, yes, and I think they can only do more because there are more avenues now for disseminating the, the, the news, online reporting, uh, with innovative things like you people on Sahara, um, you know, TV are doing. So, yes, I think they're rising to the challenge, and I think they, they ought to be commended. In measuring time, you, you chronicle the story of two twins who took different parts. And, and I know you, you've looked at, you've said that this situation is really about uh, political and it's a Nigerian problem. But there are still some people who strongly believe that, um, that the, the two parts of Nigeria or several parts of Nigeria, they are drifting apart. Uh, do, you think, do you think that at a point that looking at that as a solution may be the alternative um so you mean i mean like, the, the idea that several parts of the country they are drifting apart the south south the north the you know different parts is, is yeah. that why and why are people afraid of seeing that as probably the one of the options if if nothing is working to bring bring it together yeah there's that temptation you know to look at that and think that you know once we break apart, all our problems are going to end, and we're going to have we're going to live happily ever after. Um, I think that's a it's a it's kind of limited way of looking at it, um, really, because it's, it's more complex than that. You know, um, if for instance you break the country into north and south, you still have to like break the south into west and east, and you go to the east, you have to break the east into south, south, and you know, and other things like that. Because it doesn't stop. It's a process that, that kind of feeds on itself. Um, um, and w when you come to the north, 
you say you want to break the north. Um, where are the Christians going to go? Where are the Muslims going to go? Because definitely they, they cannot live together under you know the what was prevailing the prevailing circumstance. There's so much um, disaffection. Um, so my thinking is that what makes Nigeria unique and strong is our diversity. We have Muslims, we have Christians, we have you know um, traditional religion believers. We have all sorts of languages. It's what make it's, it's that's what make other people respect us and fear us and kind of admire us because of this diversity. And it's not only Nigeria that has that kind of problem. When you look at countries like India, <laughs> there are differences, there are, there are civil wars, there are factions going on even more than um, we have in Nigeria. But the thing is that they are able to make it work in a certain way. You know, they have made their democracy work. What we need to do is to find a way you know, um, to do that, instead of thinking that, you know, oh, we break up, then everything, everything works. No, there will still be injustice. What we need to do is to make the system work. Um, so that's my, that's my belief anyway. Yeah, you, you have a very fascinating biography. Uh, you, twice you dropped out of school, uh, disappointing your father, and then on the third time you went and you excelled at University of Joss. I want to know how much of um, what kids become has something to do with the environment, uh, uh, especially if you want to look at it in the context of, of people who decide to pick up arms and, and uh, attack the society they came from. How much of that is their environment? How much of that is um, their own decision? And because that's the basis of trying to find a solution. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that, you know. Growing up, now when I look back at it, um, I see myself. I, I I even thought I was behind because I, like you mentioned, I dropped out of school. Um, I finished secondary school at I think 16 years old, and I went to um, ATBU in Bauchi um, when I was 16, 17, and then I dropped out, you know, and and I. Before I went back to school, I was, I think, 20 or 22. And I thought I was behind. But now when you look at the universities, you find 30-year-olds in 100 level, for instance, um, people who are 28 in 100 level. When I was 27, I was a lecturer at the Federal Polytechnic in Bauchi. And I was even behind there. Um, but now when I look at my younger brothers, so when you look at all the, limit, the kind of diminishing opportunities, you wonder, you know, where are these people going to go to? You know, I have brothers who have finished university now and they're not working. They're living with my mother. Um, so that is, it's, it's not just in my family, it's all over the country. You find people just sitting by the, by, by the side of the road with nothing to do. And there's so much money in the land. And there's, you know, there's so much ostentation. Um, why won't people get angry? You know, I mean, you can't, even charge your phone to make a phone call. Um, these basic things that all citizens should enjoy, people don't have it. So that's the difference between our, our time, our situation. Even though I dropped out of school, there was always an opening. I knew that I could become something, I could progress, because there were opportunities. Um, but now these people look at it and there's nothing. You know, there's just kind of a, a big wall in front of them. Um, and the government should realize that. It's not just in, in the north, it's in the Niger Delta, it's in the south, when you go to Lagos, when you go, wherever you go, the country has just kind of um, refused to create opportunities. Look at all our money that's, that's kind of um, lying in, in, in the foreign reserve. Why don't we be rose with it? Why don't we bring it to the country and do something with it? Employ people, you know? Um, but unfortunately, it's not happening. So, will you say in the last 10 years, who felt the people in Nigeria? Is it the intellectuals or is it the people? Is it the people who are following? Who, who will you blame for the failure of the country in the, in the last 10 years? I tend to agree with Chino Achebe, you know, that our problem in Nigeria is squarely a problem of leadership. I used to believe that. Um, but I think I need to um, expand a little bit on that. I think we as a people in Nigeria should begin to take responsibility, um, 
should begin to be more careful in our choices of leaders. Um, let me give you an example of what happened in January when the government wanted to unilaterally remove the um, fuel subsidy. And people came out and they forced the government to at least backtrack you know, on, on what they intended to do. That's the example of you know, the, the function of, of, of the civil society. We should be able to say no when things reach a certain level. Um, otherwise, the leaders, we, we, we know now that they really don't care about us. I mean, we've been independent for 50 years. And we hardly, there wasn't a time when we had a leader that was so um, kind of sacrificial in, in, in leadership and, and really cared about people. Um, so maybe it's not leadership that's the problem. Maybe we as a people, we're just too um, complacent. We're too trusting. Maybe it's our, you know, our tradition, which kind of taught us that we must respect the leaders, the, the patriarch, the head of the family. And we, it was a time when that kind of thing worked, when the patriarch also took care of the people, was responsible, was head of the family, and behaved as such. But now the leaders want us to respect them as patriarchs, but they don't deliver. That's the difference between tradition and modernity. We have reached a modern time now. Democracy doesn't work. Society doesn't work in that way. We all must have a voice. Even the youngest of us must be able to challenge the leader because we voted for him. In the traditional system, we didn't vote for them. We respected them because we assumed that we believed that God put them there and we respected them as such. And they earned our respect. But now leaders have to earn respect, you know, because we vote for them. So that's the difference. Is it possible really to to worship people and still hold them accountable? Um, I don't know what you mean by worship. Well, the way we regard respect, oh, it's almost like worshiping people. Uh, we don't tend to challenge them. Is, is it possible to have people in that high pedestal with, without really uh, questioning things they say and things they do and hope that they will be accountable to us? Well, we have to. We better you know, be able to because that's how democracy works. That's the assumption of democracy. When you go back all the way to Greece, you know, ancient ancient Greece, when they had, you know, um, open democracy, and people could come and speak out, even the, the, the youngest and the lowest um, could come and speak. So that's the assumption. That's, that's the only way, actually, that democracy can work. We have to make them look at us in the face, you know, and respect us and see us for who we are. But when people are kind of kept in poverty and they take money from these leaders and they are just hungry and they can do anything. I mean, you find a person killing for just 1,000 Naira because they are so poor, you give them 1,000 Naira and they go and kill another person. That's, that's, that's how bad it is. Um, so how do you think that that person is going to challenge the leader, you know? But unless we come to that stage where citizens are respected and the leaders begin to respect the people, now what we need to do is to find out how do we do that? How do we make people conscious of the fact that they have power? Um, we need education, but look at our universities. Um, education, 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 I think that's what I need to emphasize. As a writer, you know, as, as a thinker, that's really important. That's what we're lacking in Nigeria. In, in your novel, Measuring Time, history was a, a central part of that story. And if you look at Nigeria, it appears as if it's a country that is constantly in crisis, and, and the magnitude of that crisis continues to increase with time. Uh, if you look at corruption, in the last, in the last two years, we've, we've had stories of corruption that, that are beyond what we, anybody could have imagined. How do you think that um, we could invent that new society when people look back, they see that this is progressively getting worse? Well, they say it's darkest, you know, <laughs> in, the night is darkest before it gets light. Um, democracy takes time. That's really, I'm beginning to look at it in that way. Um, it takes time. When you look at all societies, when you look at Europe, when you look at America, they've had a succession of wars and uprisings, you know, and, and difficult moments in their history. Um, so that's what I used to kind of console myself. I say that well, we're, we're a new nation, and our our history is particularly even more 
difficult because it was created on a basis of a divide and rule where the, the, the colonial masters um, deliberately incited one part against the other so that they could rule the center. So we have that. We must never forget that. Um, so when you look at it in, in that light, you see that we, we are on our path you know, to becoming something. I think Nigeria has begun to emerge with a certain personality, a certain characteristic that you could say that this is the Nigerian personality, um, as opposed to before 1960 when we were just a collection of, um, of, of, of ethnic groups you know, and different um, kingdoms and, and, you know, and, and all sorts of things. It's only people like us who were born after 1960 that could actually even say that we were born as Nigerians. Think about that. Our parents weren't born as Nigerians. They didn't even think of themselves as Nigerians because there wasn't a country called Nigeria until 1960. So it's only people who were born after 1960 that can even begin to think in terms of belonging to a nation, not just to, 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 to a certain ethnic group and all that. So I think progressively, um, we, with that kind of thinking, and if the government can encourage that kind of thinking, you have to encourage the idea of being a nation. Because the moment you keep hammering about, no, you're from this side, or you're from that side, or things could get better if we just break up, you're never going to get there. But I think we have that pool of, of young Nigerians. Just go online and see all the Niger websites and all the things and the thinking. They call themselves Nigerians, which is really a very interesting thing. And I think that is where our secret, you know, that's where it might lie. All right, we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we are going to involve uh, our viewers. They can call us via Skype and join this conversation. We are going to expand this discussion, talk about the amalgamation of Nigeria and the role that individuals are going to play if we are going to save the country.